Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today, I'm really excited to read a very interesting chapter from George Hunt Williamson's amazing book, Other Tongues, Other Flesh. We've had some previous episodes where we have established that George Hunt Williamson was absolutely an inspiration for the Law of One material. And check out my episode on The Secret of the Planet Maldek where we get the origins of the Maldek story that's told in the Law of One material about this planet that was destroyed, that is what we see as the asteroid belt. The Law of One material is a channeled work. Check out my previous episodes for a better explanation of that. But one of the interesting ideas that comes out of the Law of One material is the idea of Orion. I have an episode on Orion, so check that one out where I read the channelings from the Law of One material that are in reference to Orion. Orion represents the negative polarity in the Law of One material, indicating that there are multiple sort of galactic federations that have interests on this planet. One of them is a positive polarity that is in service to others, and one of them is a negative polarity that is in service to self. And in my discussion with Aaron Abke and others, the Orion story is very interesting. They may have been around for a long time, may have been a part of the process of the evolution of mankind on Earth, and they may have influenced politics, social experiments, a variety of things. To the extremes, we get the David Icke who says that we have these reptilians. In any case, there is a way to research this further and we can get the origins of the Orion story before any of that was written all the way back in the 50s. George Hunt Williamson was famous as a ufologist who claimed to have communications with space intelligences and we get the first references to the fourth density from George Hunt Williamson. He has a chapter in this book that's amazing that's dedicated to Orion. And we get some new information that we aren't really told about in the Law of One material, which may or may not be true. You have to take it for what it is. But he's going into the myth of Orion to explore what really happened and what it really is. And I was fascinated. Some of these references go all the way to the Bible. The Intruders from Orion, George Hunt Williamson. One of the enigmas of the saucer speak was found in the following statement made by space visitors. Evil planetary men who abound will attempt contact with evil men of Saurus. Side note, Saurus is the name of Earth by these alien intelligences that George Hunt Williamson is speaking to. Will attempt contact with evil men of Saurus for destruction. The good men of stars must unite with the good men of the universe. Again, they said, We must tell you about Orion. Many there wish to conquer the universe. We are here to warn you of this also. The Orion solar systems are much like Saurus. The principles of good and positive and evil negative are universal. We must tell you that Orion is coming soon to Saurus in a square star body. Orion systems want to destroy. Remember, Orion is evil, negative. To discover what space intelligence is meant by use of the word Orion, we must go to the Bible and to ancient records. In Job 38, 31 through 32, we read, Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, Kama, or the seven stars, or loose the bands of Orion, Kessel, Canst thou bring forth Maseroth, the twelve signs, in his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Here is the implication that the Pleiades sends forth vibrations of peace and love, and that Orion, because of opposite or negative vibrations, has been bound. Chapter 38 of Job came to Job through the voice from the whirlwind, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, Job 9.9. There is an interesting cross-reference here to Genesis 1.16. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, 
the lesser light was for the ruler of night or darkness, and the greater light was for the ruler of the day or light. Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name, that strengthened the spoiled against the strong, so that the spoiled shall come against the fortress. Amos 5, 8 through 9. In Amos, the same implication is found. At some time in the past, Orion attempted to interfere with the seven stars or Pleiades and was bound, but is now attempting to interfere on earth. It appears that Orion tried to destroy the Pleiades at one time. They were in the shadow of death and universal law bound Orion, but Orion was only forbidden access to the seven stars of the Pleiades. His evil influence could still emanate to other sections of the universe. The spoiled Pleiades were strengthened against the strong Orion. Orion in Hebrew is Kessel and means strong. Then the spoiled Pleiades came up against the fortress of the strong Orion. Another interpretation of Job 38.31 is, Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands drawing together of Orion? Mashakoth translated as bands means drawings together. This refers to Orion's drawing together other planets into its own confederation of evil. The constellation Orion takes its name from a giant hunter of Greek mythology. His sword hangs from his belt, and it is the middle star of the three in line in Orion's sword, which appears a little too large and hazy to be a, simply a star. It is a nebula. To understand the nature of the Orion Nebula, the following general information is given. Nebula, as distinguished from ordinary star clusters, fall into two classes, having entirely different characteristics, namely the Galactic Nebula and the Extragalactic Nebula. Galactic Nebula are found within the galactic system and also in the exterior systems. Two types of nebulosity are found in the galactic system, the diffuse nebula and the planetary nebula. Diffuse nebula are of irregular form and often of large angular dimensions. Some of them, like the great nebula in Orion, are faintly luminous. This great nebula is the brightest of the bright diffuse nebula. The galactic nebula are concentrated towards our own Milky Way galaxy. Unless they are members of other systems, they are clouds of gas and dust in the star fields. Extragalactic nebula are systems exterior to our own. These nebula seem to avoid the region of the Milky Way because they are generally obscured in these directions of dark nebula of our system which congregate there. The Great Nebula in Andromeda is an extragalactic spiral galaxy, whereas the Great Nebula in Orion is a vast gaseous galactic nebula, greenish and irregular form. Therefore, the nebula of Orion is within our own galaxy and is a diffuse nebula. Since it is younger than Andromeda, it is still in a gaseous state, whereas the latter is a spiral nebula. The fact the planet Hatan belongs to one of the star suns of this galactic system of Andromeda indicates the greater age of this galaxy. The Universal Temple of Records is also located on Hatan and only a world of great spiritual advancement could be so honored. The negative space intelligences from Orion are not coming directly from the nebula itself, but are coming from planets of star suns in the vicinity of Orion. The word Orion is used by space visitors to indicate the general area from which evil influences originate. Further confirmation of the Bible interpretation is found in mythology. Orion is the mighty hunter, the strong one, his aspect is so imposing in the sky that in all people's legends he represents something great or giant. In Greek mythology, it was the vainglorious giant hunter Orion who boasted that no animal could be his match. His bragging excited the ire of Juno, who sent a scorpion to sting him mortally on his foot. In the sky, Orion is supposed to counter the attack of Taurus, the bull, Venus. 
Also, according to the Greeks, the Pleiades were the seven daughters of the Titan Atlas who were changed to doves when pursued by the giant Orion and finally were placed in the heavens before him. Orion flee the Pleiades or the singing stars. To the ancient Egyptians, in the V dynasty, the constellation of Orion was Sahu, hunting through the heavens for gods and men to rip apart and boil for food. The Hebrews knew it as Kessel, the foolish or self-confident, or as Gibor, the giant, identified with Nimrod and tied to the heavens for impiety. In the modern Arabic, Orion is Al-Babador, the strong, and al Suja, the snake. In China, the constellation is known Shen. To mix among the Buryats of Siberia, Orion represents the three Wapiti, being chased by the demon hunter, Erlik Khan, overlord of the underworld, and his three dogs. One of the Wapiti has been wounded and is bleeding, red betel geese. When the hunt ends, the world will cease to be. A Peruvian story says this constellation is a criminal held in the heavens by two condors. In North Africa, the stars in Orion emerge from a muddy well, and Rigel, the last star to rise above the horizon, is the foot in the mud. To the Greeks, in addition to being the mighty hunter, Orion was called the giant, the warrior, the cock's foot, and the double axe. From the time of Ovid and Hyginius, we have the story of how Orion was named Hyrius, Orion's father, had been childless, but he was a good man. One day he was visited by three strangers who were Zeus, Poseidon, and Hermes in disguise, and he showed them unstinting hospitality. Granted a boon, he asked for a son, whereupon the three gods took an oxide and urinated on it. Hyrius buried the hide according to instructions, and at the end of ten lunar months, Orion or Urion after the fluid that made him was born from the earth. The stranger gods, the hero born of the liquid of the gods, the supernatural birth from the earth, these are more serious matters than this almost flippant Roman myth makes them. Zeus was the sky god and could be symbolic of many planets in space, including the earth. Poseidon was the god of the sea and is symbolic of Atlantis, Poseidon, and Lemuria, Pan. Hermes was the winged god and messenger of other gods. The fact that the gods urinated in order to create Urion, called later Orion, shows that the waste of Earth and other planets Zeus and of Atlantis and Lemuria, Poseidon and of angelic orders Hermes was used to populate originally the Orion worlds. The waste were those souls who no longer could advance in these other areas. Remember, space friends have said, to the slop we throw out, we never return. The slop or waste was discharged or secreted into the Orion area, and arriving souls had to begin the lessons of life over again. Only through countless experiences under the Orion vibrations could they discover the great path. It is these souls we are dealing with when we speak of the intruders. The hide with the urine on it was buried in the ground. This means that the waste representing souls of the cast-out ones was placed on Orion worlds. From this waste came forth the inhabited planets of the star suns in the vicinity of the Orion nebula. These souls migrated to Orion, but in contrast with the migrants who arrived on Earth, their abomination period was before the migration and not after it. In other versions of the Orion story, he is a son of Poseidon. This would indicate also that individuals from Atlantis or Poseidon migrated to Orion. It is believed that the good people escaped from Atlantis by spacecraft and went to the planet Mars while the evil destroyers lost their physical equipment in the sinking of the lost continent and migrated to Orion in spiritual form. Myths of Orion's death vary. Does his death signify his being bound? He was bold enough to challenge Artemis to a contest in throwing the discus, or he tried to tape one of her maidens, and so was slain by an arrow of the goddess, or she caused a scorpion to sting him, which is why Orion's constellation sets as scorpion rises into the sky. Since Artemis in Greek religion was known as a virgin goddess of nature, does this mean that Orion challenged nature? It is possible 
or the discus is an ancient symbol of interplanetary saucers. Perhaps Orion, like the doomed Lucifer, tried to exalt his throne above all others. Instead of hydrogen power utilized by Lucifer, Orion tried to subdue the universe with spacecraft or discus, but in this contest nature, Artemis won out, or he tried to subdue one of the nature's attributes, Artemis' maiden, so he was bound, slain by a power or active arrow of nature, Artemis. Does this mean that Orion also tried to be all-powerful one through the mastery of the terrible wind? Scorpio is the flying eagle and, as already shown, is connected with Ezekiel's vision, St. John's revelation, and the tracks on the desert. Is it any wonder that Orion sets as Scorpio rises into the sky? Still another myth says that Artemis loved him so that she forgot her duties. Once, as Orion was swimming or wading far out in the sea, Apollo shone so strongly about him that he was a dark blur on the water. Then Apollo challenged Artemis to hit the vague mark. The unerring huntress immediately slew unwittingly the giant. Does this mean that because of the experimentation of the Orion people, nature was perverted or forgot her duties? Apollo, symbolic of spacemen of the positive forces, shone so strongly about Orion that he was a dark blur. Did the good forces of Apollo gain complete control over the misused natural forces and thereby cause Orion to be slain or bound? The ancient inhabitants of Mesopotamia and India know that Orion's early rising pretended storms. Even today, the sections of creation is a stormy section, one that seeks to conquer, to subdue. The Babylonian Talmud states, if it were not for the heat of Orion, the world could not exist because of the cold of the Pleiades, and if it were not for the cold of the Pleiades, the world could not exist because of the heat of Orion. This means that without positive and negative polarity, there could be no creation. Without the evil or negative Orion, the good positive Pleiades would have no incentive to progress. The negative forces keep the positive forces in continuous spiral movement. Otherwise, there would be no advancement in the cosmos. In fact, there would be no cosmos. Space intelligences have said, Orion is the great hunter of the universe. It is gorgeous in the skies, and men of Venus know it very, very well. It is somewhat erratic, and like a great hunter, it is always after its prey, especially Taurus the bull. Orion is surrounded by small round ball bodies, type 2 fireballs. These are always in action between the sun of our solar system and Orion. No one in Earth has seen them yet. There are fighting worlds in Orion. They are always ready for action and looking for trouble. Orion disturbs other planets and keeps them from operating in the correct manner. Also, Orion is not too highly evolved scientifically because they use the old style craft. However, they are masters at projection. Orion interferes and holds back. People of Orion are not our kind of people. They do not belong to our confederation. They interrupt and are unruly. At present time, there is a small group of people on Earth working for Orion. These people are sometimes small in stature, with strange type eyes. Their faces are thin and they possess weak bodies. They come among you to disperse all things not in keeping with their own ideas. They upset our plans. They run amok and we avoid them. They prey on the unsuspecting. They are talkative. They astound intellects with their words of magnificence. While their wisdom may have merit, it is materialistic and not of pure aspiration toward the Father. We have our own men who watch over these pirates of creation. They have their own council and the Orion Confederation, but they know little through their own ingenuity, for they are the universal parasites, disturbers, negative elements. Soon they will be eradicated. Watch out for controlled persons in your midst. Our men will spot them and you will be informed of them. They come often in disguise, but men of the Confederation are never deceived. We know them. The Orion people are the intruders in your world, and they come from planets belonging to countless star suns engulfed by the nebula of Orion. If the Orion men fail in their mission of disturbance, they return not to Orion but to Sirius. This is their cycle of return. They must learn the great 
path they will learn but in the meantime we will not have them disturb our preparations and plans for the earth planet we try to help them and suggest work to aid them but they are a stubborn race they cannot enter your atmosphere usually by spacecraft but they can and do reach the earth world by projecting their intelligence into weak earthly bodies which they completely control for short periods of time in order to perform their disturbances watch for them their numbers increase as the sorrows of earth increase they persist but they will not succeed but we will succeed for our mission is of the father's authority and his will shall prevail worry not about these orion influences they cannot harm those who serve the infinite father pity them love them pray for them for they know not what they do the strange disappearances of two men on november 11 1953 once again touched off the controversial issue of whether or not human beings are being snatched off the earth by weird interplanetary flying machines many feared that the inexplicable levitations into the sky by invisible and unknown forces sometimes accompanied by electrical or magnetic phenomena which science is powerless to explain were caused by the visiting flying saucers space friends are true friends they are not subjecting captured men to vivisection or horrible death in monstrous spacecraft chambers of horror with the power at their command they wouldn't be wasting their time with a mere handful of earthians what then are they doing certain people are disappearing of that there is no doubt some are levitated into the sky even in the presence of witnesses others never return from plane rides and the wreckage is never found commercial and military planes crash and no bodies are discovered what happens to the missing occupants on november 18 1953 the los angeles mirror reported that two missing electricians may have been kidnapped by interplanetary invaders in a flying saucer the two saucer enthusiasts were carl hunrath and wilbur j wilkinson they had taken off in a rented airplane from gardena airport on november 11th with a three-hour gas supply despite widespread search no trace of the plane or its occupants has been seen the rumor of that plane was found dismantled on the top of a california mountain with no sign of the two men is unfounded officials claim that nothing has turned up in that case yet wilkinson's wife told reporters that carl hunrath was an avid believer in flying saucers she also told them the two men believed the end of the world was nearing and that strange little men from the planet mars or massar were ready to invade us mrs wilkinson evidently misunderstood much of what hunrath and her husbands were doing and saying first of all the world is not going to end and the little men are not from mars or massar but are from our own satellite the moon the space visitors have proven this already by their actions hunrath claimed to know the whereabouts of a flying saucer they had recently landed wilkinson's den was lined with flying saucer pictures weird signs and formulas which mrs wilkinson said were supposed to be the new interplanetary language of course i don't quite go for all the flying saucer talk but carl convinced wilbur they actually existed said mrs wilkinson she then said carl had tape recordings of conversations with men from other planets who landed here she showed reported messages tacked on the wall of the den which were supposedly received by radio from the interplanetary visitors one was from rega from the planet massar carl hunrath called up several of his acquaintances in los angeles the day before his disappearance he informed them he was going to take a trip he said others have left the earth to go to other planets so do not be surprised if i leave soon the flying saucer pictures in the den had been taken by george adomsky and the weird signs and formulas were received by our group working in northern arizona starting in early august 1952 the tape recordings that hunrath had were taken during receptions of the arizona research group in clips quotes and comments b10 may 5th 1954 a bi-weekly release of the borderland science research associates correspondence of harold t wilkins is quoted mr wilkins wrote it happens that i have spent years of research into petroglyphs and prehistoric symbols in central south and north america and my tentative conclusions were that some of the wilkinson glyphs suggested or resembled not maya or aztec symbols but forms found in the north brazilian jungles the mato grosso and one in the unknown prehistoric civilization in la plata island off ecuador 
another in California and the ancient water sign of Cataclysm. Also another recalled the Mu'an sign of Coition or the double uterus. How can the question be resolved even when the Los Angeles Postal Authorities do not know where Hunrath's family has gone? I know not how came Carl Hunrath or Wilbur Wilkinson who have all this very peculiar and recondite knowledge which cannot be picked up in a day or even a year. The symbols are not reworked Aztec figures and Hunrath received them from our group for study purposes. That is why they were found in his and Wilkinson's den. These symbols are given in this book under the Solex Mall in the section called Other Tongues. Much of the symbolism is characteristic of the ancient scroll writing of the Atlanteans and of the ancient pictographic writing of Lemuria. Atlantis and Mu used modified forms of the original Solex Mall. Symbols of this type exist in South America, especially in the Mato Grosso, because the ruins of great antiquity there were originally colonies of the Lost Continents. Colonel Fawcett, the famous English explorer, died while attempting to locate these fabulous lost cities of the ancient white Indians of Brazil. The Wilkinsons have three children and moved to Los Angeles from Racine, Wisconsin on June 28, 1953. Hunrath had been in correspondence with Wilbur and convinced him that he should come to the West Coast because of important saucer developments. Wilkinson was then employed by Hoffman Radio Corporation where he was quickly promoted to head of the inspection department. Wilbur, who was 38, had his den and home full of all sorts of electronic equipment, radios, turntables, and tape recorders. Mrs. Wilkinson told reporters that her husband wasn't too interested in saucers except when Hunrath was around. She said Carl was the one who talked us into coming to California because he said he could actually show a saucer to Wilbur. She later told them, I just can't help but think that flying saucers really had something to do with their disappearance. I knew Carl Hunrath personally, but I never met Wilkinson. It was in the winter of 1952 when I first met Carl at George Adomsky's on Mount Palomar. He claimed he had just arrived from the east where he had been working at Oster Manufacturing Company in Wisconsin. During the next few months, he visited many saucer researchers including Frank Scully, Gene Dorsey, George Van Tassel, Gerald Hurd, Mr. R of the Radio Contact fame, and he was my house guest in Prescott, Arizona for a week. It was during his stay in my home that I gave him copies of our findings. He was a strange man who could change his mind and ideas from one moment to the next. He couldn't help but like him, but at times a feeling would come over you that made you wish there were a million miles between yourself and Mr. Hunrath. Everyone who came in contact with him had the same experience. Was he controlled by Orion forces? He visited saucer researchers as a friend, then systematically began to spread rumors about them and their work, which had no basis in fact. He came to California unknown and soon was stirring up dissension wherever he went. Was it his purpose to cause trouble in the hotbed of controversy existing among the California saucer enthusiasts? Was it part of a plan formulated by negative forces? Why was Hunrath a brilliant scientist one moment and not too bright electrician the next? Theories as to the present whereabouts of Hunrath and Wilkinson are plentiful. Some believe that he has gone to Mars or some other planetary haven and there are many of Carl's followers in Los Angeles who will tell you that this is positively so. Several experienced pilots believe Carl cracked up on the side of Big Bear, a rugged mountainous area of California. The plane didn't carry much fuel, and Big Bear is deceiving to those who have not flown over it before. Unrath hadn't flown in a long time, and he had never flown near Big Bear before. The downdraft and elusive qualities of the mountain could have doomed the small plane. However, the wreckage should have been discovered when the snow melted in the summer of 54. Some people think the two men went to Mexico, but they didn't have enough fuel for the trip. It has also been reported that Carl is in England and will reappear shortly and has also that he has been seen recently in Los Angeles with his hair dyed. He's been called a spaceman, a man possessed of evil spirits, an angel, a member of the FBI and a Russian spy. What he really was no one knows but we can guess. What really happened to the two missing men and where are they now? It is not believed that space visitors had anything to do with their disappearance. Carl and Wilbur are not on Mars or any other extraterrestrial body. They are on Earth, whether dead or alive. 
There is an ad that appeared in the personal section of the Los Angeles Times on April 1954. Worried telepathists, this does it for you. Please prove my well-beings by writing of contacts you may recall. Carl, Box R240, LA Times. Biometrically, Hunrath does not show up as unusual, but what samples were tested? Handwriting, etc. of Hunrath when he was himself or when he was under control. This would make a vast difference in biometer results. Before Hunrath arrived in California, he had become acquainted with another so-called genius from Ohio. This man called Carl one night saying that he had returned from Japan where he had been working with Dr. Nagata on the electromagnetic experiments. He asked Carl if he could come up to see him since he had heard that Carl was interested in magnetic research. The man came and he stayed four days and nights. When he left, Carl had become an avid saucer enthusiast. Carl said he thought the man was a spaceman because he answered his questions before they were asked and displayed telepathic powers. This man also is very brilliant at times and then again at other times. He apparently can't even add two and two. The same man had an article printed in an Ohio newspaper stating that the saucers were from Saturn and were here to invade and conquer the earth. This is the pattern of the intruder to disrupt, cause dissension, strife, trouble, interfere. In Florida, there is a minister who claims the world is about to end but he will sell any interested party a piece of land in a vicinity of Orion for a few dollars. How does he expect to get the buyers from the doomed Earth to Orion? And if the Earth is going to end, why does he want to accumulate the ready cash? Again, the word Orion gives him away. He is under negative control. In the saucer speak, a Wyoming evangelist is quoted as saying that God's throne and God himself are located in the Orion Nebula. Once again, the world tells the story. He preaches that the flying saucers are piloted by pitchforked devils, another intruder. In Michigan, a group of sincere researchers came in contact with a young man born in 1935 who claimed to be from another planet. He said he was born on Earth but incarnated here from elsewhere. He was small in stature and possessed a weak, thin body. He drew intricately details of strange machines for scientists and claimed the information came from his mentor, a certain Kagmon from outer space. The machines utilize crystals, cosmic rays, and light were supposed to change into energy by the Kagmonian process. This young man had a brilliant mind, a little too brilliant for one of his years. At other times, he was moody, sullen, and crude. Once again, the pattern of the intruder is revealed. An astrologist who read his chart said he was a very remarkable pattern. I might even say more complex than I have seen in quite some time. Biometrically, this subject's devices are shown to be incomplete and there remains much to be worked out. This young man was in his glory when he could subjugate others to his whims and fancies. Once he said, we have no emotion for earthlings. An intuitive psychic mentally received the word infringement three times when she first met this man. This is only one of many cases of Orion control over earth beings. The space friends have said they would keep out all negative forces, but they also said, a square star body was coming to earth. As time goes on, the antichrist or negative forces will become more powerful. This is a sure sign of the second coming. At the present time, only projected intelligences into weak earth minds is permitted. And even this would not be so if the victim refused to be used and put under control. The square star body has been observed in recent months. On November 7, 1953, a man in Ohio was out in his greenhouse when suddenly he heard a strange whirling sound. At the same time, the greenhouse lights dimmed. He ran outside and saw a 30-foot-long barrel-shaped object rush overhead and apparently land in the woods back of his house. The man called for a state patrolman and they both saw the object through the trees as it landed in a clearing. They went into the house to call for more help and when they returned, the strange craft was gone. Later, the man found this wristwatch was magnetized and he had to replace all of the greenhouse lights. The next day, he walked to the clearing where the craft had landed and discovered several small footprints in the earth. Other witnesses also saw the footprints. The unusual thing about them was the fact that the right footprint was longer than the left. Scientists from Washington, D.C. looked over the site shortly after the landing took place. The story was on radio, but minus the details, of course. Whether the object was barrel-shaped or not is not known but it left a square impression on the ground. This same man claims he was taken to another world later in this craft, and his wife says he disappeared for a short while recently. 
He's a heavy drinker and therefore an excellent subject for Orion control. Maybe he did go to another planet, but which one? When this man says he wants nothing more to do with his space visitors, does it mean his rational mind at times fights the control? On Wednesday, May 5, 1954 at 9.30 p.m., Herbert Flick of Phoenix, Arizona saw that he, what looked like a flying boxcar go over the valley. Flick said the object was square with a light on each corner. He went toward the South Mountain at a high rate of speed. He said, then abruptly turned, came back and passed over me. He estimated the object was at least at an altitude of 2,500 feet. He watched it for about eight minutes, then it disappeared, heading east. At one time, he noticed the square craft neared him, slowed down, and circled as if observing something. Mr. Flick says the object he saw was very large. It appeared to be piloted and was black. It must have been traveling at about 450 miles per hour. The object was not a radio sonde suspended from a balloon, nor was it an airplane or helicopter. On June 19, 1954, a weird light, so bright it was difficult to look at, moved slowly across the sky over Port Huron, Michigan. Selfridge Air Force Base officials and police had no explanation for the glow, which witnesses said looked square and sometimes barrel-shaped. The object passed high in the sky and moved very slowly. It appeared at 5 a.m. and disappeared to the west at 6.30 a.m. The brightness of the light was compared by police to the glow of an acetylene torch. Hundreds of residents viewed the craft and police phone lines were busy for hours handling calls from worried citizens. A man and his wife in Iowa saw a square, brilliant object pass overhead from west to east. They claim it was very high and was moving slowly. A wasp speaks of aero ships and fire ships and crescent ships. It also mentions Orion ships in 4918. Thus, Ashang, well-skilled in the course and behavior of worlds, gathered together his millions of angels trained in arduous enterprise and furtherance of Jehovah's will. Quickly, they framed and equipped an Orion Port Agon and illuminated it with firelights and bolts a half million miles, even on the outskirts of Anacharon, and they stood close above the earth, almost so near that the sweeping moon would touch the downhanging curtains of Ethereum fire. And here they halted, that both mortals and angels belonging to the earth might behold and fear. The serpent people of ancient legend are believed to have been Orion intelligences projected earthward. Is the fabulous rainbow city under the Antarctic regions a central location for such projection? Serpent people, antichrists, or intruders, they all represent the same thing, negative polarity. In ancient times, man ran away from demons, devils, witches, and monsters. Today, he still runs away from that which he calls the unknown. Many people remember the H.G. Wells book, War of the Worlds, or the masterpiece by another Wells named Orson about an invasion from Mars that frightened a good many radio listeners a little over a decade ago. However, there is no reason to be frightened about space kidnappers, for the levitations are not always due to saucer phenomena. Some of the disappearances have to do with other dimensions of time. When the saucers pick up someone from the earth, they are only picking up their own. Farmers have been working in their fields. When suddenly they start to go straight up into the air, the only thing ever seen in connection with such levitation is a blinding flash of light that appears directly overhead and moves away swiftly. On Glastonbury Mountain near Bennington, Vermont, five persons vanished without a trace. Near Schaffhausen, Germany, four men disappeared in a single day. Three of the levitations were witnessed by others, and all missing persons ascended straight up with great rapidity. At Politzfer, Livonia, there were eight human ascensions in two hours. Near Pawar, India, there were six ascensions, all witnessed by large groups of people over a period of six months. One of the most astounding levitations was that of the 60-ton coastal schooner Maida in the Bay of Bengal several years ago. The ship was almost completely lifted out of the water, held there for a minute, and then allowed to fall back into the water with a great splash. There were many witnesses to this happening, and the day was clear and calm. Every year, there are literally thousands and thousands of human disappearances, and each year thousands remain unsolved. No trace of them is ever found. 
Many people who disappear, such as criminals and wanderers, dissatisfied husbands, etc., are recognized later, even though they may be living under different names in faraway places. The bodies of murder victims are usually always found, so thousands of human beings are going somewhere. Recently, someone said the purpose of the kidnapping is to obtain human specimens for laboratory experimentation, the final object being the conquest of the earth and the subjugation or destruction of all humanity. If the saucer people are intelligent enough to come to us across the great space frontier, I doubt very much if it would take hundreds of years to make their surveys. Levitations have been going on for centuries. It has been argued that the kidnappings are necessary because conditions are quite different on other worlds and therefore space visitors must study our atmosphere, our germ life, and of course they must study us. It would not take very long to accomplish such a task and besides the saucer intelligences have said that living conditions are not very much different on other worlds than our own. True, there are differences, just as there are on our own Earth, but they are not as great as present-day science believes. When we think of laboratory analysis, we think of our own standards according to our understanding at this time. Vivisection is not necessary for study according to space visitors. They have greater developments for the study of everything. They do not destroy the created beings of the infinite father. They never kill. Even the thought of killing is aberrant to them. Therefore, the Orion forces are not kidnapping people from Earth. Their only power is through projected intelligence, and their square star bodies may be observed more and more in the future. But they can do no harm to those who refuse to be influenced by them. Levitations and other disappearances are due to time factors and space friends picking up their own people to take them home again. Recently, astronomers discovered that two stars were born in the Orion Nebula. These young stellar twins are symbolic omens of things to come from that section of the cosmos. But the Infinite Father is with us, and Orion shall be bound again as he was in the past. We need not concern ourselves with the intruders of Orion, for they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, 14. Isaiah 41, 29 says, Behold, they are all vanity. Their works are nothing. Their molten images are wind and confusion. These are the intruders from Orion. This is a really fascinating chapter. And if we go back to the beginning and get some of the implications here, it's implied that there was a battle in the past between Pleiades and Orion. And Pleiades won and bound Orion. And then Orion has created this federation. As we have talked about in my episode on the Confederation of Planets, when you hear people channeling the Galactic Federation of be very careful not to attribute it to the confederation of planets that's talked about in the law of one. There are multiple different federations. Some are good, some are bad. Some come off as good with language that makes it like they're these great, wonderful, peaceful, loving beings, and they're not. Every single word is used to deceive and manipulate. So you have to be cautious when you take channeled works that imply communication from some sort of galactic federation. And in this case, we have a federation that is made up of Pleiades and Hatton and a variety of different star systems. And if you're like me, as you read and hear these words, you start to visualize this amazing galactic battle of good and evil that has been going on for billions of years. When they talk about this in the law of one, they say, well, is Star Wars a true story? And they say it's like a child's story, a child's fable of something much more complex. And there is a group that is bound service to self. And in that journey of service to self, it is all evil. They don't care about anyone else and they want to subjugate and control all others. I can tell you since I've started my channel that you can see the presence of negative influences all the time, especially when I do an episode like this. Somebody will come along and it's always very polite and done in a way so 
that it's not outright, hey, I'm from Orion, or I'm a negative being, or I have a specific service to self path, but they come to you with a smile, and in the process, you can be deceived. It's always this unusual deception. In my own experience of people that I believed were influenced, I've met people that say that they started channeling, and then next thing you know, they're completely changed and acting weird and super selfish wanting to control and manipulate people and so i have been very cautious about any sort of channeling somebody mentioned hey brian are you really channeling no not i'm not channeling i'm channeling my own higher self and that's it but some people when they do channel got to be careful because there are these negative orion influences and they have grown in power and this was written in 1950 and so we're talking about 70 years later it's much more of an influence that I see in the world as we come closer to this transition of new earth because there's a harvest that's happening on this planet for service to self as well. So they're trying to harvest the service to self and it's influencing our everyday life. And we can be of service to those who need it by stopping the infringement that is occurring on many different levels from these influences. And the best thing to understand the influence of negative polarities, understanding that it's incredibly sophisticated and advanced. I would recommend that everybody research and understand neuro-linguistic programming, hypnosis, any form of communication that is done in forms of manipulation. There's been enough research done now through frequencies, sound, movement, and action that People can be manipulated to a certain level. And so there's an ongoing battle of manipulation going on between good and evil in this world. We see it in our social media. We see it on TV. We see it everywhere. And you have to become the neutral observer of this information. As you focus internally on accessing the light and being of service and letting go of that small self, then something starts to happen where you have a part of you of your own mind that knows the difference. If you simply start asking yourself, am I being influenced by negative influences or positive influences? You'll start to get a positive answer. So I found this really fascinating and interesting, especially the discussion of the different myths, the discussion of the mentions in the Bible. Honestly, I do not remember Orion and Pleiades being mentioned when I read the Bible. So I will be going back and reading this to confirm that it's talking about it. Now, he says when the seven sisters are mentioned, that is Pleiades. He is saying what they're mentioning and referring to. So we should all take this information and if it doesn't resonate, forget about it. But if you're like me and you're interested in the origins of the law of one, where they got this information, and it's a question that's important because my first question is where did Carla get all that information when she's speaking as a channel. As it's indicated in future Quo channelings, they can only use any information that's already in your mind to channel. It's implied that they can go beyond that in the way that they channeled through Carla. But there's always that small possibility that she has created this out of whole cloth from her subconscious knowledge of things like Edgar Cayce mentioning the law of one and George Hunt Williamson mentioning Orion and Maldek. So these things were in the general knowledge for a very obscure sort of literature. Remember, Carla Ruckert was a genius. She had a very, very high IQ and she read a lot. So she had access to this information. When I go and listen to the Law of One material, it is different than even the Quo material and it has a certain syntax about it. So take of it what you will. I like to research this stuff to learn more and these references are fascinating. And if there is a positive polarity, if there is a positive federation out there, then I say that I am a member, that I remove myself from the membership of this planet and I say I'm a member of the positive polarity, no matter what planet I am on. And I am an agent of love here to help those who are of service to self and service to others in any way, shape or form by bringing love and knowledge and wisdom to them so they understand and can actually escape the grip of service to self. Can you imagine 
what they're saying and implying here in the law of one material and what they're implying in the George Hunt Williamson material is that we don't go to hell when we're terrible people. When we are Hitler or someone else, we go to another planet. We reincarnate on another planet based on our vibration. And so there's a whole vibration of people who on previous lives were evil and they're all on one planet. Can you imagine what will happen? And this is what is happening. We have an entire planet of evil people that have reincarnated onto this planet. And they've continually reincarnated. And that's what Orion is. And all the people that are positive and loving are reincarnating on Pleiades. And Pleiades can't be interfered by Orion anymore because they won a war in the past. But Orion sees Earth as another Pleiades. They can come here and they can control it and add it to their federation. So we play a role in this battle because they are not kidnapping and they're limited by the Council of Nine of what they can actually do to interfere on the planet. They can influence through channelings and projecting information, but we have a choice right now to say that we are not influenced by either the negative or positive. We are influenced by the God within us and we embrace this individual light and let it express itself in perfection, in love as the creator. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.